All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here for today's sermon on paid subscriptions. This is a little bit more of an advanced topic than what I've been presenting on, at least insofar as most writers and authors and other creators don't get around to offering paid subscriptions until pretty late down the road. Uh, what late means, I mean, it's usually not the first thing that you're going to launch because it requires having some sort of a platform, some sort of an audience in order to gain um, any subscriptions in the first place. People have to know who you are usually before they're gonna be willing to subscribe. So I'm gonna switch over to the slide presentation I have prepared for today, uh, just a moment. There we go. So to, to set the context for where I, like my experiences and my background with, with paid subscriptions, I started off in traditional publishing, as many of you know, working for a book publisher and a magazine publisher, um, really a multimedia company in the end. And so my first experience with paid subscriptions was with magazine subscriptions, you know, uh, you know, or if, if you've ever subscribed to a newspaper or anything that comes on a regular basis, that's really kind of the foundational work. Uh, some of the principles that go into subscriptions for newspapers and magazines actually play right into the sort of subscriptions I'm going to be talking about today, which are more online oriented and digitally driven. So some of my first lessons learned were from the magazine business, and I've certainly applied what I've learned there from very traditional methods of getting subscribers um, to, to the online life. But there are, of course, very big differences. And the, the other thing that's happened, at least within the last, gosh, it's probably been going on for a decade now, but it just feels like there's a groundswell of attention and interest currently within the past two years in paid email newsletter subscriptions um, in publications that need to put up a paywall because they're not getting the advertising revenue that they need. And so there's like almost every single industry that you look at today is looking at, should we have a subscription model? How can we incorporate a subscription model in, into the business? And you can, you know, this, this is going back to like Netflix and all sorts of streaming services that are subscription models. And then looking specifically at the author writing publishing community, um, subscription models tend to come into play uh, when you're producing content on a regular basis, whether that's nonfiction, short stories, something else, it could be a podcast, it could be a YouTube series, we'll, we'll look at some different examples. So let's begin. Uh, first, a little bit of definition around this. The, the terms here get very squishy very quickly. And so when I talk about paid subscriptions, I'm also sort of talking about membership models as well. And these terms tend to be used interchangeably. And I'll try to delineate between the two, but I'm also going to talk about them separately, if that makes sense, uh, at least the way that I look at the different values that they provide and whether you want to call what you're offering a subscription or a membership. So when I talk about a subscription, I'm talking about something that's quite formal, something that arrives on a schedule, it's fairly predictable, people are signing up for something that they're going to receive. So the magazine, the newspaper, some sort of content, it could be digital, it doesn't have to be print, but you know, something that has a real shape to it. The difference between that and a membership for me, at least the way I talk about these things, is that a membership could be literally anything, you know, you could develop a membership that actually doesn't even give people anything meaningful. They get, they just get to say they're a member, <laughs> you know, they're a member of the club. Um, and when people join your club, they might just be joining because they want to feel like they're part of an exclusive group. Um, but of course, some memberships do offer really meaningful value and content of all kinds. So again, I'm going to be using these terms a little bit interchangeably, but when I talk about subscriptions, I am talking about something that's a very formal offering with, with hard edges to it. Now, so that brings me to the, one of the easiest ways to start a paid subscription today 
is either through Patreon or through another service called Substack. I'm going to mainly talk about Patreon for now because Substack is really just a tool, I think, uh, to support email subscriptions. I want to talk about Patreon because it's really, I think, in a, a, a super gray area uh, as far as is it a subscription? Is it a is it membership? Is it donation? Is it crowdfunding? I mean, it's it's this amalgam of lots of different things, and people use it for different purposes. And so I find it sometimes quite hard to talk about what you use. Patreon for because each writer, creator, artist, musician is using it in a little bit of a different way. So I think initially, you know, this is years ago when Patreon was first getting off the ground, it felt a little bit more like a more like a pure kind of patronage model. You were going to get your fans, your thousand true fans to support your work, and you would offer them some freebies or interaction along the way. I think Patreon has become a lot more sophisticated, at least in how people are using it. Uh, its costs have also gone up if you're if you're joining the platform late in, in that they take a bigger chunk of your subscription or membership revenue. Um, and so you'll see people use Patreon to run what I would consider very formal subscription models, but this is a platform that's ready to go. You don't have to know any tech. It's a system for essentially creating a never ending pledge drive. And by pledge drive, I'm thinking about, you know, how NPR, PBS, they will have these spring and fall pledge drives and you and you can donate, you know, uh, on a one-time basis, but often they're trying to get you to pledge like $5 a month or $10 a month or $100 a month. And so that's what Patreon is. And you're trying to get people to pledge that one dollar, even if it's just one dollar, I think that's the lowest amount someone can donate. Even if it's just one dollar a month, you're trying to get them to come in at some level of support that they that's affordable for them. And in exchange, what you're giving them, it, it's very variable, and it's also it can be tiered. So you know, you might not really give much of anything to the person pledging at your one dollar level, but you might give a lot to the people pledging at the hundred dollar level. So the principle with this thing, with Patreon, and this would be similar if you've ever run a Kickstarter campaign, is that generally you are, you know, you have multiple tiers and each tier is rewarding people at a greater rate. In any event, I think Patreon is, is again, an easy way to get started if you don't really have much, uh, you don't have much in the way of tech savvy and you really need a platform that will help get you started. It's a really great starter tool, beginner's tool, but I think it does have some considerable limitations once you want to get really involved with how you engage with your community, with your members or your sub subscribers, however you think of them. And I'll give you one example just right now. In fact, there is a Patreon that I've supported for at least, I think a year now, it's called Study Hall. It's for freelancers, particularly freelance journalists. And they do a weekly newsletter and they have communities uh, like private groups that um, that trade tips and leads and secrets of the freelancing life. And so I, I support this and they started on Patreon, but only like two weeks ago, they decided that Patreon was too limiting and they needed to move everyone to a website community model. So they're using a, a membership plugin on uh, are they using it? I don't, I actually, I don't know what tech they're using, if I'm going to be honest, but they're on some sort of independent website that has a paywall. So that shows you, I bring that up only to, to make it clear that there are limitations to Patreon. I don't know that it befits really sophisticated models, but for most writers, it's super easy to start. Um, so Sarah is suggesting, um, if you get a subscriber through your Patreon or maybe some other place, should you offer people a tote bag? And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there is definitely writers who offer what I would call the equivalent of a tote bag. Um, the author equivalent to that is my free ebook, like the first book in a series or this free collection of short stories or this digital download of some kind. Um, some people will send personalized postcards uh, to new patrons. Uh, so they're all, the the only limit is your imagination. Like there are no rules around this. Like you get to decide how you're going to reward people or even if you're gonna reward people. Um, so let me talk about just a few examples to, to put some definition on this. Four very different examples in my, in my mind. So Joanna Penn is someone who's 
I think, incredibly well-established, advanced in her career. Patreon is not the center of her business model whatsoever. Now, for some writers, it is, and it's pretty amazing how that's happened. But uh, for Joanna, this is kind of a side thing, a way to get a little bit of extra money in the door to support her podcast, which is, has been going on for 10 years now. So if you become a patron of her podcast using Patreon, you're going to get some extras. You're going to get access to the archive and some other bits and bobbles that others aren't going to receive. But her podcast remains free. Let me be clear. Like anyone can listen to Joanna's podcast at any time without paying. But if you are a patron of it through Patreon, you will get some extras. And so you can see at the time I took the screen capture, she was getting you know close to $500 a month for, uh, pot, for podcast support. Monica Byrne is a literary novelist who has used it very effectively to get support for her writing her next literary novel. I'm, I imagine some of you know that literary novel writing is not the most lucrative career, so you do need some other way to sustain yourself. She's had a Patreon now for maybe five years or longer. Last time I checked, she was getting about $3,000 a month in patronage through that. Jason Sanford is in the science fiction and fantasy writing community. He does two different things with his Patreon. He has a level uh, that I belong to, I think it's one or $2 a month where you get very specific types of updates that he writes. And he does something called genre grapevine that I really enjoy and wanna receive. I think it maybe comes out twice a month, something like that. But he also has short stories and other works that he gives to people pledging at a higher level. And then Jay Swanson is quite sophisticated on, in his use of Patreon, very well established, earns a sustainable living from his patrons, and it's to support his YouTube videos. And if you've, his videos are incredible. Uh, he lives in Paris, and a lot of his videos relate to doing stuff in Paris, things that would interest people visiting Paris, um, but they're also just entertaining in and of themselves. So he's another person to check out if you're curious about. Um, how you connect content you're producing maybe for social media, how that connects to a Patreon page and how you give people bonuses or extras or something, um, how you persuade them to do that when they can get the basic content for free. Uh, Darian asks about scale and he says, it sounds like study hall probably has a massive membership pool, but what if it's much, much smaller? So I don't know how many members study hall has, but if I had to guess it's, it's in the thousands, it's in the four figures somewhere. Um, but when they started, of course they had zero. So I imagine they reached a point in their growth where they're like the Patreon does not cut it anymore for the services or for the interaction we want to provide because it was really cobbled together. It really felt a little bit like put together with bailing wire and masking tape um, using a mishmash of like Google groups and, um, and Patreon tools. It just, it didn't feel cohesive and it was a little bit annoying to tell you the truth. Uh, so I'm really glad that they've switched over. But that's, I think this kind of, um, I don't, I, how to put it, it's really nice to start out with a tool where you might not you might not really know how it's going to go, and so it allows you to ease into it. And then when you do have the numbers to merit it, you can then move off it. Not that it's not painful to make those transitions; it is quite painful. Um, but when you have that number of people that makes it worthwhile, you know, then you can start to put resources behind it. You can, you know, put a strategy behind it. And, you, you know, you have this really valid reason. You have this evidence of need. You have proof in the market that it's going to work out. Um, and Diane is asking which Patreons are my personal favorites to follow. So I, let's see, I've, I mentioned Study Hall, which now isn't on Patreon any longer. Jason Sanford is someone I support. Uh, Jay is not someone I support on Patreon, but I consider him a colleague. So I'm, I'm checking in on him and Joanna is similar, a colleague and I'm checking in. Um, so I know there are more out there and I'm not the best Patreon supporter in the world. Um, I actually support more people through Substack, which I'll talk about later. Uh, let's see, we have a question. Does Patreon offer significant extra reach or is it primarily used for the functionality? That's a wonderful question. And my impression of Patreon, full disclosure, I don't use it, is that it's not offering you much, much or anything in the way of marketing. 
So I don't, people don't go to Patreon just to look for people to support. That's not that sort of a platform. I really consider it more of a tech, a technology service um, that you're using to help launch something that you will then have to really market yourself. Um, I would, it would be similar to doing a Kickstarter campaign in terms of the marketing. Like it's possible that your campaign might get noticed by someone driving by, but it's pretty unlikely. So you have to have some way to spread word of mouth, which is why I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, you know, paid subscriptions are a pretty advanced piece of content uh, to, to some, it's, a, it's an advanced piece of the business that you might be engaging in in your author career. So you usually have to have some sort of foundation laid before you're gonna get anywhere with it. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about my experience moving away from Patreon, my experience with paid subscriptions, failures and successes. So with um, Scratch Magazine, some of you who've been following me for a long time, like going back to 2013, you may be familiar with this publication that I launched with a partner uh, who's also in the writing and publishing community. And this was at the height of the app craze when all of the publishers, especially um, in the literary community and the journalism community, everyone was launching an Apple app. People thought it might be the future. Um, let me tell you a secret. It's not the future of magazines or newspapers or anything, um, although there are certainly some publications that merit having an app. In any event, at the time that we germinated this idea and launched it, there was a startup called 29th Street Publishing that if they really liked your idea or publication, for no cost, they would support you on their platform. They would develop the app for you. It would connect to your website, uh, meaning that you just upload the content to one place and it would populate the app and then it would populate the website. It had a paywall to it and it was all subscriber driven. So you had to pay and become a subscriber to access the content in the app or on the website. So, I mean, this was, it was a fascinating thing to go through, honestly, to see how something in the startup phases, like how 29th Street was working, how we played a role in that, in, you know, alongside other publications and what they were trying to do. And then it all kind of spectacularly failed. <laughs> it's, um, but not necessarily because the publication itself was bad or the content was bad. Um, it, it's just, it's not easy. It's not easy to, to get people on board, reading stuff in an app to develop habits. Um, so we did a great job, me and my partner, in launching this magazine because it had a very focused niche. It was, we, it was the intersection of writing and money. It was very easy to explain to people what the publication was about. Um, it wasn't hard to sell people on it. We got a thousand subscribers from the beginning and we were replacing those subscribers when they fell off. So we had good growth. We weren't seeing a lot of churn. So all of that worked great, but we did not charge enough. We were only charging $20 a year. Granted, this was only quarterly. So we weren't coming out that often, but still $20 wasn't much um, when it's being split between two people. And you also have expenses because we paid all of the writers. Um, and then the other issue is that Scratch reached its two-year anniversary. Uh, by that time, I had stepped away for a lot of reasons I won't go into. Um, but on its two-year anniversary, roughly, my partner, who was still carrying it forward, more or less made the decision to pull the plug because, 29th, or because one of the tech providers that was being used, which would be similar to a Patreon, um, it wasn't Patreon, but it was very similar, uh, they went out of business. So, you know, when you're relying on some of these startups or platforms, if they go under, chances are you're going to go under with them. If you don't have a ready other, you know, solution off the shelf solution, it just causes a lot of heartache um, when those things happen. So that was a very different time though. I don't want to scare anyone. Like this was, you know, between 2012 and 2014, there were a lot of things getting launched, a lot of experiments happening, a lot of apps and other things um, there was a lot of investment, a lot of money to be had for the, these sorts of initiatives, um, and a lot of them have unfortunately failed. So I don't think it's 
I don't think Patreon is in danger of going away. I think it's almost too big to fail at this point. But of course, it does raise the question of when you choose a service or a platform to build on, how confident are you that it's going to be around in another year or two years or five years? And of course, there's no guarantee uh, that they're not going to change the model on you or charge you more. Um, so there are always these issues to deal with whenever you're launching uh, a digital subscription of any kind. So the next subscription that I launched was the Hot Sheet, and this launched in 2015. And so we're coming up on its five-year anniversary. And I also launched this with a partner, although it's now run wholly by myself. And this is uh, done strictly through email. So whereas Scratch was delivered through an app and through a website with a paywall, Hot Sheet is only email. You can't read it on any website or in an app. Um, that might change in the future, but it keeps things really simple, really simple and direct. And I don't have to worry about instilling habits in anyone to visit a website or to open an app it's gonna land in their inbox and they don't have to do anything, assuming that it doesn't go to their spam folder, which of course is always an ever present issue. So, you know, I've stuck with it for five years and I feel like that it, it, it succeeds where Scratch didn't uh, for two reasons. It's charging enough, it's uh, $59 retail. It does get discounted in partnership with other organizations like Authors Guild. So it's charging enough to make it sustainable and there isn't any proprietary tech involved. In other words, I'm not using any systems that are gonna disappear, or even if they did disappear, I still have what I need to move elsewhere. I only use two services to run this. I use MailChimp, which is an email newsletter marketing service. I could use any number of services, I think at least three. I don't think MailChimp's going anywhere. Um, and then I also use a system called Chargebee to manage subscriptions and payments. Um, and there are lots of different companies and services that do what Chargebee does. So I'm not really worried if they should go anywhere, I can still download all of my subscriber data and take it somewhere else. So I'm still in charge of that data. I still hold on to it. It's not gonna be trapped anywhere. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about the early days of this, um, of this, uh, of the hot sheet subscription, because I think we did a couple things. Uh, this was me and Porter Anderson, my partner at the time that were really helpful uh, to get the ball rolling. And I see there's a question about, uh, from David about uh, charge B. It's, it's charge B, B E E, like buzz honey B, charge B. Uh, it's not a plug-in, it's, uh, it's a really big service at this point. It's usually working with um, much larger businesses than my own. So it's a subscription management system. Um, and I got in in the early, early days of it, 2015, when it was, it cost me $79 a month and it still cost me $79 a month to use it. They're not taking a percentage of my profits. They're just charging me that flat fee, no matter how much I earn, which becomes pretty important because some of these services we're talking about take a cut of your revenue. So charge B doesn't, that's one of the reasons that I selected it. Um, but if you go and sign up for charge B now, uh, you're not gonna find a $79 rate. It's gonna be much higher. So I've been grandfathered in at that lower rate and I hope that I don't have to leave it anytime soon. Um, I'll note here too that Charge B is, um, it does require you to have some technical prowess. So, you know, you have to know how to set up things on a WordPress level yourself um, in order for it to interact well with Charge B and then to have Charge B hook up with MailChimp. So, there are like different communication pieces that have to happen. It's not outside the ability of most people, um, but it's not as easy as Patreon. Like, there's like, it's, it's very different um, in managing those two types of tech, uh, two different, two very different tech burdens there. Okay, so back to a couple things that were really important for the hot sheet early on, we did a soft launch with what we called our VIP list. VIP list were people who knew me and Porter really well. So they're people we had met at conferences um, people who we had likely collaborated with, friends, 
those who, you know, we had years long relationships with people who we would like to give them this publication in the hopes that they would read it and maybe talk about it. Uh, there's no way we would want to charge them. They, they're, they're too close to us in terms of collegiality or in friendship. Their value to us is much more in giving us feedback, telling us the truth about the publication and in spreading the word. So we had about a hundred people roughly to start on that VIP list. Uh, we could have had more. I think it actually would have been better if we had more. It just, again, it helps get the ball rolling with word of mouth. So we had that soft launch, meaning that we didn't take paid subscriptions for the first two issues. And we just did what was like practice mode or beta mode. Um, and after that, after we did our first two issues, we got feedback. We asked, asked them to complete a survey. We made some changes based on that feedback. And then we rolled out with the first truly paid issue about a month after, and we opened up the door to anyone to subscribe and pay. Something really important to consider, you will never, ever get as many people interested in subscribing or the greater, a greater volume of people subscribing than when you launch. It becomes really important, and I did not treat it with that uh, level of wisdom or knowledge when we first went out. I treated it more as our second soft launch. <laughs> it's not that I didn't announce it or that I didn't you know, do all the things that you would probably wanna do, but I, there's so much more that I could have done. Like I could have really put a lot of time and energy into that launch and I just, I treated it like another class that I was hosting. I did the requisite tweet or Facebook post. Um, I mentioned it in my newsletter, but that was kind of it. Um, looking back, I would have made a much bigger deal out of it because that is where you're going to have the highest level of interest and volume of subscriptions that you then have to build on um, for years, potentially, you know, that's your base. So keep that in mind. It's not to scare anyone, um, again, but it is a huge opportunity that you don't want to waste. The other thing we did is that very quickly, we had a couple special issues that we offered for free. So we launched in uh, fall 2015, and then the next major industry show um, after Frankfurt was Digital Book World. And so when Digital Book World came around in January, we both were there and we both reported on it and we made that issue an extra bonus issue that we made free. So then, you know, we had kind of another bite at the apple, you might say, because we, we publicized this issue and made it free everywhere we could think. And we got another nice influx of subscribers after that point. And it was important that this is the event we chose because we knew that the people who would be interested in Hot Sheet were the sort of people who would want to know what had been talked about at Digital Book World. They would want the learnings or insights, even if, it, if they couldn't attend. So this was a really helpful thing we did. And we, we, we had a couple instances of this in our first year. And David asks, what sort of marketing might I have done besides the social media push? Um, well, my, my push was so just focused on the assets that I already owned. So my own social media, my own email newsletters, I didn't, I didn't do a press release. I didn't contact journalists, reporters, bloggers, and influencers to say, hey, we're coming out with this thing. Um, and I think you want to know about, you might want to know about it. Um, certainly we had VIP folks that were on the list. Um, and some of them included those sorts of people. Um, but we should have done a more, um, a much more deliberate marketing and publicity campaign where we tried to get media coverage for what we were doing. And one of the reasons I know that we kind of missed out on that is because my partner on Scratch mag magazine, Manjula Martin, she was very savvy at that. She had the sort of publicity savvy I have never had, and she knew how to get the media to get to, she knew how to pitch the media to get coverage. And so when Scratch debuted, we got all sorts of write-ups like in Slate, um, poets and writers. I think we might have even been in the New York Times book blog. So we just got all of these great mentions. And I think we could have gotten that, me and Porter, for Hot Sheet, but we just didn't even try. So I would have definitely put that into the mix. Uh, Dave, uh, Darian is asking if I've changed the pricing at all for Hot Sheet. 
Uh, no, it stayed, it stayed at $59 since the launch. I thought that we might raise it, but it's just never happened. Um, I think that it's possible the price will go up when there are more features. So for example, if, if and when I can manage to get the back issues available on the website and make them searchable, I could see um, either increasing the price for future subscribers or having different tiers of pricing for people who would like access to that archive. But 59 feels, it feels about right. Um, and I'm not, I'm not super enthused about increasing the price based on what, what's being offered at the moment. Um, as far as how you or any other, anyone else should determine pricing, it's so, it's so subjective, like, it, it, and there's so many factors. It's going to depend on your market and the sort of following you have and what you're offering and like just so many variables. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, most people aren't charging enough. So if you are setting a fixed price, like on Patreon, you're not necessarily setting a fixed price. I mean, you are, you do have to decide what the tiers are, but people can come in low, they can come in high, they have some selection. For a paid subscription, they might not have a selection. It may just be this fixed price and you have to figure out what that price is. Um, so I see a lot of people offering paid subscription newsletters in particular and they're pricing way too low, in my opinion. If you're a professional, if this is business information that's going to um, just increase your business intelligence, give you the opportunity to make better decisions, you know, I think the pricing should be higher. Um, so definitely look at your competition or look at the market and, and make a decision that fits you. But again, generally, I think people go too low. Uh, there's also a question about whether the MailChimp account that I use to run Hotsheet, if it's, um, do I just have one MailChimp account? Um, so it sounds like Darian knows that I have a much larger list than I do. So the Hotsheet MailChimp account that I use is totally separate from the rest of my business that I send email from. So uh, if, you've received, if you receive electric speed, if you receive my daily blog alerts, that's, that stuff is serviced on a different MailChimp account. Hotsheet has its own dedicated account. And I would suggest that if you're planning to do something like this. And then another question, um, if you are membership based, if I were to estimate what percentage of my current base is made up of the original base? Well, wonderful question. It has to do with retention and churn, which are really critical for having a, su a successful subscription service. How do you retain people and not lose them? And it's really hard for, I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but I will say that in our first year, maybe first two years, we had roughly a 50 to 75% retention rate. If I had to look at it now, I it's probably lower. It's probably because you just lose people. So it's probably between 25 and 50%, if I had to guess. There are people though who drop off and come back on. Um, so it's a for some people, they only subscribe when they feel like they're really missing out or when they can afford it, or you know, when they're at a different point where they feel like they actually have the time to consume it. And this is important. I think some I didn't plan to discuss, but I think some newsletters in their good intentions to provide as much value as possible, they actually increase the burden on the person receiving it. And if you don't have time to consume what you're given, you will, you will more likely unsubscribe because you're like, I'm paying for something I'm not using. So saving people's time, it should be a serious consideration. And I think Hotsheet is actually, uh, has made the same error that a lot of publications make. I think it's probably too long. I think a lot of people don't get through it. Um, and so if I were to make it shorter, if I were to make it more frequent, that actually might be a better decision. But that's those considerations are fairly complex and I'm, I'm gonna set them aside for today's sermon. Uh, within the last year, I did do some really important housekeeping work for the hot sheet where I redid the landing page for it. So by landing page, I mean, this is where people decide if they're going to subscribe or not, and where they sign up. The language you use on this page is pretty critical. Uh, that might be obvious, but uh, again, I think I took a little bit too much of a casual attitude toward it. 
um, and just assume that you know people that the value would be evident to people. Um, sometimes it is. Sometimes your reputation or your name or your brand precedes you, and people will just subscribe because of who you are. But you also have to convince them again. This is going to be valuable that they don't want to miss out. So I, I really did a full uh, overhaul of this uh, in the spring, and I've seen really nice results. The other thing I did is that in uh, in the spring I launched a welcome sequence to Hotsheet. So, and this is something you want to consider for any sort of membership or subscription you do. It doesn't matter who's posting it, where you're at, how serious you are. A welcome sequence has really skyrocketed how well I retain new subscribers. For Hotsheet, this is, becomes more important because it only comes out every two weeks. So it can take a while between the sign up and that first issue. And I want to make sure that a, they remember they subscribed because people do forget, even though they've paid. And I want them to see immediately what benefit they're going to get aside from those issues just landing in their box. So that welcome sequence consists of three messages. The first message arrives as soon as they subscribe. The second message arrives three days after that. And then the last message three days after that. So they get the whole thing within a week. Those three messages point people to the most valuable content that Hotsheet has published in the last year. So the first one is about market trends, where sales are headed, how COVID has affected the market, at least for right now. Um, I should, meaning I change these welcome, I change the welcome sequence every two weeks. I make it super relevant to what's happening right now. The second message is more evergreen content, like um, some of this, some of the things that we've done to cover beta review software services, um, paid review services, things that are of perennial interest to writers. And then the last one is about hot issues or topics, uh, which right now libraries and audiobooks. So right away, people are becoming familiar with the sort of content that's being produced, um, how and why it's gonna be helpful to them. And it just, you know, is a really nice way to Again, pinpoint this. This is why you subscribe. I'm going to give you as much of that value as I can right now, and get you prepared for what's coming in the next issue. I have a visitor here who's also interested in having a paid subscription. Uh, okay. So, looking at the questions here, uh, Jack is asking if I've formed an official LLC or something similar for the hot sheet, and I have. Uh, when it first launched in 2015, as I said, it was with. Uh, another writer, uh, Porter Anderson, who's a journalist. He writes for Publishing Perspectives. And he and I each have our own businesses. So like I have something called Jane Friedman Media LLC, and he has something called Similar. It's under his name. So when we formed the Hot Sheet, we formed the Hot Sheet LLC, and it was a LLC partnership. Um, it's no longer a partnership now because I wholly own the business, but it is separate from Jane Friedman Media, um, because that's how it started. It could, you know, now potentially fold in, but I kind of like it being separate because frankly, it allows me to sell it off if, if I should want to do that in the future, although I, I don't have any intention, but it does keep things very clean in that way. Uh, Yasmin asks, what made me decide to offer a 30-day free trial and then an annual sub versus three like, why don't I do three month, six month, one year packages? Is it just easier to do the former? Yes, right now it's just easier to do the former. Um, the 30 day free trial, I've actually over time tried to express it more as two free issues because that actually makes more sense when people are thinking about what they're gonna receive. Um, but a lot of people, if it's a membership model, you, you might wanna think about it as in terms of a length of time, like one week, 30 days. Um, in the future, I can see maybe there could be a three month or a six month, uh, but for now it's, again, it was just, it was simplicity to start and it, but it's, it would totally be worth experimenting with shorter subscription time periods. I think if I did it, my first choice would be to launch a monthly um, rather than a three, three, three or six month um, so that people feel like it's less of a commitment in case they don't like it. And 
Um, and I, part of that is also informed by my experience at Writer's Digest when we offered writersmarket.com as a subscription and you could get it as a monthly or you could get it as an annual. And about half the revenue was from monthly subs and the other half was from annual. It was a really interesting down the middle split. But you actually got more money from the monthly because they were paying more on a monthly basis than the annual people. So you also want to think about that if you're going to give people that, well, I don't know if you call it convenience, but you know that lower risk option, then you should, in the end, they should end up paying more over the course of the year. So if I had to come up with a monthly rate for a hot sheet, I don't know, it might be somewhere between seven and 10 bucks a month, I suppose. Uh, Jacqueline asks, how long in advance of launching would you advise that one do the social media push? Um, you know, I, it, I don't know that I would go too far in advance. Um, you want, I wouldn't start doing a real social media push until people could actually take action on it. Like they can actually do a pre-order or a sign up or something. Um, to th I, there's a recent example actually in the writing and journalism community I think this is Andrew Sullivan. He recently left New York Magazine. And so he's now started his own Substack. We still have to talk about Substack. And right now, anyone who subscribes can do so for free. He is going to charge, but he's kind of, you know, he's in this soft launch period where everybody, it's an open door for everybody and it's getting a lot of push on social media and elsewhere. So for as long as you have that door open free, trying to get as many people in as possible if you're doing that sort of a launch, um, I would just want to make sure that you people can take action when they see it. I'm worried, you know, if you start too early before people can take action, are they going to remember? Um, will they take action later? You want to get them right when they're interested is my philosophy. So I want to talk about a few other sites, membership subscription models that I admire and have, have learned from. Uh, Stratechery was one of the earliest. This uh, is by a consultant named Ben Thompson. He's an expert in the media tech industry. And so he launched a subscription to his blog, essentially, although it does have some membership components. And by membership, I mean, if you subscribe, you get to be active in the comments. Uh, you get to attend events that he hosts or that he used to host. He's probably not hosting them right now. Uh, and so some other like uh, more personalized engagement pieces um, so membership, when I think of membership, I think in terms of socializing, community, engagement. Um, so if you subscribed, you would get the content, but you also had these other social opportunities. The information is something that partly inspired me with Hotsheet. Again, this is uh, focused on the tech industry. And it was launched by a journalist who used to write for the Wall Street Journal doing tech reporting. And it's not, it's not just her, it's a huge team at this point of people doing tech reporting. They charge, gosh, it's somewhere around three to $400 per year for access to the information. And they have since rolled out different types of um, shorter term models. I think now it might be possible to get like months to month or short, at least shorter terms. And they've also added more membership components to get people to pay more. So if you want to get on the monthly or weekly call with the reporters to talk about what they've been reporting on, you can do that if you're plugged in at a higher level. But it started out as what I would call like a pure vanilla <laughs> subscription. And then in order to increase engagement and increase people's spend, they've added those membership components. There's a community called Indie Thinkers that I just recently stumbled on. And this is where uh, kind of academics go if they want to be more entrepreneurial and maybe leave academia. It's a pretty interesting community. And this isn't really a, sub I don't consider it a subscription model at all. I consider it kind of a pure membership model where if you join for this monthly fee, you get access to a community board, you're going to get access to joint work sessions to keep you accountable, monthly conferences. And the the moderator or owner of this community does do tutorials that are behind the paywall, like, you know, how to set up your MailChimp newsletter or how to do a great podcast, or I don't really know what's behind there, but I'm just imagining what might be there. So, but it's not necessarily on like a scheduled basis, like you're going to get one tutorial a week. It's just like, 
there's a library and there will be more as time goes on. So that's, uh, to, as I mentioned earlier, it can be really squishy, this difference between sub and membership. So I consider this more of a membership type of site. Another membership site that you may have seen and maybe even paid for is Manuscript Academy, which is a spinoff of the Manuscript Wishlist uh, initiative that was started by uh, an agent. So if you're not familiar with Manuscript Wishlist, uh, definitely worth checking out. It's where editors and agents, it's a Twitter, a Twitter hashtag that agents and editors use to talk about what they wanna see submitted to them. And so there's an entire site devoted to this and then the Manuscript Academy has spun off. And so if you pay a monthly fee, you get access to all sorts of education and uh, classes and so on. All they also have like one-off opportunities. If you don't want to become a member, you can pay to just take this one class with this one agent. If you're thinking about the differences between subscription and membership, and I know I've probably been clear as mud in delineating the two, um, here's a quick kind of a quick a, B comparison. So for membership products, I think about it in terms of getting exclusive access, exclusive content, a high value community of like-minded people. There's a reason to remain in that community, a compelling continuing reason. And you wanna feel part of something, you wanna to belong to something. Subscription product, which is how I categorize Hotsheet as well as you know Scratch when we had it, you have a very consistent, reliable, by-the-clock publishing schedule. There's, there's probably less interactivity or community, but you could still have those components. And the content is solving a problem for people, or it carries a really high benefit. It's something people aren't going to get anywhere else. As far as the tech for doing all of this, on the membership subscription side, I've already mentioned Patreon. There's also for, if you're really adept at WordPress, you can use things like Memberful and Podia is a platform that's where you would actually build your membership site. It's not connected with WordPress. You would just build your whole offering on Podia, Podia, however it's pronounced. And in an earlier sermon, I talked about my use of Restrict Content Pro and WordPress. So if you're curious about creating a membership site or a subscription site with a WordPress plugin, you might wanna take a look at the sermon from two weeks ago, all about WordPress and these plugin systems. If you're interested in running a paid email newsletter, I, I talked about myself using Chargebee and MailChimp, but that is a pretty advanced setup for the average person. It would also probably be too expensive since I got in on Chargebee at the ground level. There are two big players right now if you run, want to run an email subscription newsletter that people pay for or that has a free component. You can have a, a, like a, a freemium model or a melded hybrid model. Substack is definitely the one that's getting all of the attention right now. It's getting written up in lots of publications as you know where journalists are going after they get laid off. They go to Substack and they start you know getting paid by readers. And then there's also something very similar. It basically does the same thing, review, R-E-V-U-E, -E, as you see there on the slide. So Substack is, is pretty fascinating. It did not exist when I launched Hotsheet. If it had, I would have been really tempted to use it just because it's so streamlined. It takes out all of the guesswork. And now Substack is doing a lot of support services for the people who use it. Um, it's doing grants, it's, it's offering some marketing, it's, you know, it's trying to help its creators do better. So if you are looking for a system that might possibly reward you or feature you or just make you feel more like a community, like you're in a community of other people doing the same thing, you might want to take a look at Substack. However, just be careful. It has a lot of venture capital money in it. Um, I don't, I don't think it's profitable yet, um, but whenever I see a lot of venture capital money, I get a little, a little hesitant because it's, it, it can cause changes to the model or to the business. It can create pressure. And then they start doing things that aren't good for you, but that are good uh, for venture capitalists. So just be cautious. Um, certainly 
as I mentioned with Patreon, you could use Substack as an easy way to get started, to grease the wheels, uh, to take off the burden of figuring out the tech side and just start rolling it out. Um, and then in the future, if you want to do something that's more entrepreneurial, more free and independent, like what I'm doing with Hotsheet, then you can do that. You can download your subscriber list and go off into the sunset with it. Um, they're not going to keep that from you. So you're not locked in at the very least. You can leave if, if you need to. Helen asks if I see Substack readers more as a business to business audience or consumer. I see it as very much consumer. So like I just mentioned, Andrew Sullivan, who was at New York Magazine is going to it. There are so many writers that are flocking to it or have flocked to it over the last year or two. Um, so I don't see it as business to business at all. I mean, there may be that sort of use, but it's generally for, it's, it's for you to reach your readership, whoever they might be. But we're talking about readerships of individuals and, and not like a business is going to subscribe. It's gonna be a reader who subscribes. Okay, so I've come to the end of at least my formal comments. Um, we've still got about 10 minutes until we hit four o'clock. I'll mention um, what's on the horizon. And then if you have more questions about memberships, subscriptions, get them into the Q&A box if you're with me here on Zoom. Um, so the next sermon will be in two weeks and it's actually an open Q&A. So whatever's on your mind, whatever you'd like me to talk about, whatever challenges you face, come to the open Q&A and we'll go through as many questions as we can together. So you can register for that by going to my website to the Sunday Business Sermon page. And then of course I have lots of online classes that are paid for throughout the year and you can find those also at my website listed under the online classes tab. Uh, Rona is asking for a quick description of review. So just to go back to that slide for a moment. Uh, review is more or less Substack. It's just a, 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 it's a competitor. There may be some differences between the two services. Uh, I don't know what they are, but they're performing the same function. They're sending a paid email newsletter. And let's see, um, Darian asks, with everything else I have going on, indeed. Uh, what would you estimate is the amount of time you spend on anything in the hot sheet universe? And he's asking me to include the back end, you know, a customer service, updating the welcome sequence, actually writing the content all in. What is, what is all that time I spend on it? Um, I would say it's easily 10 hours a week, if not 15 hours a week. Um, and it's, I wish it were more, frankly, I want it to be more. And I'm trying to actually change my business so that I can spend more time on Hotsheet. Um, it scales so well. And that's the, that's the benefit of subscription services that I can, if I'm always spending, let's say 40 hours on Hotsheet, um, which I'm not currently, but if that's what I would like to spend 40 hours a week on Hotsheet, um, as I get more subscribers, I get paid more, but I'm not working more. There might be more customer service demands, but it's marginal. Um, so it's just the scalability is much better than some other parts of my business. So I can do, I can do critiques and manuscript edits all day, but there's only a set number of hours I have. So that's one of the appeals of paid subscriptions, that if you can get more people on board, um, then you have the potential to obviously earn a lot more money without increasing the time spent. Um, I do have another person who works with me, uh, my husband and business partner, Mark Griffin, and he does the customer service for Hotsheet. Um, now that he's, he joined my business one year ago. Prior to that, I was doing all of that as well. I also have someone that I pay to do the copy editing because um, I don't want just my eyes on it. So I pay a copy editor to do all of, uh, of the work after I'm done writing. Mark loads it into the system. And yeah, and then I handle all of the WordPress development that's required, but it's pretty minimal because it's just a landing page. Um, and then the other question from Darian is, uh, I said that there's no archive of Hotsheet to access. And that's some plan, at some point I plan to do that. 
Um, so would that mean giving something, giving people something else until it's done? If someone wants access right now, they have to email me and then what do you do? Yeah, so wonderful question. So if you're a Hot Sheet subscriber and you want access to the back issues, so the archive, I have a list of links that I have to send. It is a really long list of links, five years worth of issues, five, five years of links. <laughs> and it's not searchable. So you have to click through one by one uh, to see if there's something there that you're interested in. Not ideal. No one's doing that. Very few people ask. Um, and also the information gets dated pretty quickly. You know, the publishing industry in 2016 is not the publishing industry in 2020. Although there are definitely some great things that we've written about that will always be wonderful to read no matter when we publish them. So I do put in my welcome sequence, I tell people, hey, if, if you want all the back issues, the links, I'll send them to you. But if you let me know what you're interested in learning, what topic, you, you're researching if there's something you want to know. Did we publish on Harper Collins? Um, ask, and I will tell you. I'll send you the specific links that you need to read the pieces of interest to you. So I try to offer that to people. In the meantime, I act as the index. I know everything we've published, and I can help people in that way. Um, as far as getting all of the back issues onto the site, I mean, it's not hard. It's just that there's so much of it. So it's mainly just a big copy paste job. And what I should really do is hire someone to help do it. Right now, we've just kept it internal, doing it as time permits. But if we wanna grow the business on Hotsheet, um, we need to make that investment of getting all of the archive online. So great questions, everyone, thank you. Um, Diana asks, what are some of my favorite personal Substack sites? So, gosh, there's so many. Um, and sometimes I have a hard time remembering if they're on Substack or if there's someone, there's some other platform. Um, so let's see, I subscribe to Anne Helen Peterson's newsletter. I subscribe to Jonathan Malasek. Those are two writer journalists. Um, I subscribe to... Uh, I, I, I am on Andrew Sullivan's because I'm curious to see where he goes with that. So he's on Substack. Um, I subscribe to something called Margins, and I'm now forgetting what it even focuses on. <laughs> There's one on publishing tech and innovation. That might be review instead of Substack, but say, you know, it's still a newsletter. Um, I subscribe to Hot Pod, which is all about the podcasting industry. Uh, I, I have subscribed to Austin Cleon's newsletter. That's a free one off MailChimp. So I think, you know, you're asking which Substack newsletters do I subscribe to? I just think about subscribing to newsletters. I don't think about them in terms of the platform that's running them. But I have to tell you, my I have a newsletter addiction. Like I have like 100 newsletters I get on any average day. And part of it's because of Hotsheet. Like I need to be sucking in as much information as possible from what's happening in the media industry so that I can be more informed and report back to writers. Um, so that's partly why I subscribe to so many. Um, Diana, I, I mean, I don't know that the list of things I subscribe to is gonna be that interesting to the average person, um, but Diana, you've given me a really good idea that I need to come up with maybe a list of my top 10 or top 15 that would be of specific interest to writers or authors. So I'll work on that and, and hopefully do a blog post or a Facebook post in the future with that list. Uh, also a question about how I built that landing page in WordPress, did I use a plugin? So let me go back and show that little snippet here. So this is uh, the Hotsheet landing page. This is just, uh, it's a WordPress site. So I built it from scratch using Gutenberg. And if you go back to one of my old Sunday sermons. Uh, I actually show you the back end of the Hotsheet landing page. It's the WordPress Gutenberg sermon, one of the first sermons I did. So yeah, it doesn't really require anything fancy. You just have to know. You might want to sketch out what you want the page to look at, uh, what, what you want it to look like, and then you can go in and start building it using the Gutenberg block editor. So no plugins required to do that. Uh, Liza asks if the system for sending out my welcome sequence is automated or if I have to do that manually. No, it's totally automated. Uh, there's no way I could do that manually. 
So it's uh, MailChimp has an automated sequence system that you can use. Um, so I just load it into the automated sequence uh, and I turn it on and then you can always go in and edit what's in the sequence at any time. So it automatically sends based on specific triggers and any email service you use would have, it should have something like that. So you wouldn't, you would never have to do it manually. Uh, Liza asks if the system, or no, I just covered that, sorry. Uh, Yolanda asks if the MailChimp sequence uh, is a paid feature or can free accounts use it? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's a paid feature only. So if you wanna use that feature, I think you're gonna have to upgrade, or at least that's my impression. I don't think you're gonna be able to do that um, without paying. And last question, how did I decide on the welcome sequence frequency? Uh, it's gut, it's just gut instinct. Um, but I do believe in having that first message appear right away. So like within 24 hours, and then the rest of it will probably be dictated partly by how frequently you're sending out whatever it is you're sending. So hot sheets only every two weeks. So, you know, I wanna make sure that people are gonna get at least a couple messages before that issue comes out. So I set it at every three days. I could have said it like daily, just to have it come out. Like if you sign up Monday, you get your first email Monday, your welcome email, then you get welcome two on Tuesday, welcome three on Wednesday. I think that frankly would be fine as well. But I also know that if people click on the stuff I'm telling them to click on, they're gonna get sucked into something that's gonna take them a while to read. So I don't wanna, I always, I'm sensitive to burdening people with a lot of stuff up front. So that's why I've spaced it out a little because I know what I'm asking people to do is not insignificant. I'm asking them to take 10 or 15 minutes to read something. All right, so we've hit four o'clock. Um, thank you all so much for joining me and, and indulging me in my, uh, my business focus right now really, which is paid subscriptions. This is where, as I mentioned, I hope to see my business go uh, more in this direction. I hope to spend more time on it. And um, I hope that maybe I'll be talking to you in another year about how I moved the whole archive online successfully. Uh, <laughs> so and knock on wood, I hope that happens. Um, have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you at another sermon soon. Bye-bye.